Thank you all for joining us today. The Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences is a series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is now the seventh session. If you missed any of the previous sessions, we posted them on YouTube. The link is on our website. Our panels discuss educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage, and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. My name is Alexander Machuda, and I'm today's moderator, as well as a co-PI jointly with Lars Ville Huber, who is also on the call. I also note Marie Connolly and Ian Schmutt, members of our organizing committee, and Sarah Brooks, who keeps the wheels rolling. I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar, Institutional Support, Why Can or Should Research Institutions Public Replication Packages? We look forward to hearing from our expert panelists and to your questions. Without further ado, let's introduce our panelists. Today, we're joined by three panelists. We have Graham McDonald, who's Chief Information Officer and Vice President of Technology and Data Science at the Urban Institute, where he leads the strategic planning and implementation of research, operations, and communications technology, and works with staff across Urban Institute to improve access to data, analytic tools, and innovative research methods. Lamore Peer, who is the Associate Director for Research and Strategic Initiatives at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, Yale University. Her focus is on research transparency and reproducibility with several institution level tools created at Yale. She's also the co-founder of the CURE Curation for Reproducibility Consortium of Social Science Data Archives, together with Tumai Christian, who spoke here last month, and our Cornell colleague, Florio Arguias. Courtney Butler is the data management strategist in the data utility office at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. She previously oversaw reproducibility and data management efforts within the Economic Research Division, and she now leads data management efforts for the broader Kansas City Fed with a continued focus on transparency, collaboration, and practical adoption of best practices. Uh, I think we'll start with Graham McDonald here. I'm a big fan of the Urban Institute's open data initiatives. Can you describe a bit how much of a challenge it is to ask for openness from researchers and leadership and how far that transparency goes? So are, uh, you know, is all the code uh, uh, available that produces the data? Does all the code uh, uh, used to produce policy reports? What is the benefit to the institution uh, for such openness? Thanks, Alex, for getting us started. And uh, I love this question. It's really wide ranging. And I'm just going to share a, a bit of a presentation. It's very short to just walk us through uh, that question, which I feel like requires a little bit of context. So I'm going to share my screen. Folks can wave their hands if they can't see it. Um, basically, uh, my my quick answer, because I don't like to to belabor the presentation, is I will say we don't do very well at doing those things. <laughs> We're not very well incentivized to do so by our funders or partners. Um, without that incentives, I, without those incentives, I think the short answer is that we'll make slow progress, probably unsteady progress over the coming years uh, by motivated individuals like myself and a few others. Um, but I personally would be in, in strong uh, favor of those requirements for a number of reasons you'll see uh, as I've walked through this uh, presentation. So just really quickly, I'll just give some context about urban because not everyone will have heard of us. Um, what we're currently doing in relation to your question, Alex, and then as you asked sort of about the successes and challenges and benefits of, of what we've done. Um, so again, just going over about what urban does, we provide uh, evidence analysis and tools to people make change, uh, change makers. Um, and we are, our goal is to make people's lives better, empower communities ultimately through that evidence analysis and tool work that we do. Um, our primary activities uh, that we work that we that we do to make this happen are to conduct policy research and evaluations. Um, we provide technical assistance on implementation to governments and um, nonprofits. We produce data uh, on our data catalog and data tools, interactive data tools that help people make decisions. 
Um, we provide advisory services to foundations and governments and others. We convene experts. We have a bunch of uh, events, uh, both virtually now and in person and hybrid, um, of people making change across sectors. And we translate research and communicate it. Uh, so we have a number of different functions sort of straddle the academic and policy world. Um, and then we have many goals. Our primary drivers are that our, our executive team and our organization cares the most about are, are we making impact? Are we delivering on that mission? And are we fundraising to make that impact, obviously, because we have to pay the bills and um, make that work. So there are obviously a ton of other goals that the Urban Institute has. These are very simplified lists, but I would say these are the top two things that are probably most important as we think about you know, what incentives do we have as an organization? Um, that said, despite, I think, a lack of incentives, as I said at the beginning, uh, we've done a number of things over the years. The first is we have an open data catalog, as you mentioned, Alex, uh, and thank you for the praise there. Uh, that took a number of years, and we have a lot of data up there. I think over 100-something data sets available uh, at this point. Uh, any project that wishes to publish data publicly, whether it's... Um, you know, externally on ICPSR, on our data catalog, or they want to link from one to the other, um, is required to post data on our data catalog. They should provide some limited information about like the license and use of that data, about the citation for using that data, about the um, uh, uh, the code book for that data so people can more readily use it, things like that. And we're, we're very proud that we have the data catalog up and available. Um, we have a quality assurance, obviously, initiative and code review. So anyone who wants to fill out and request assistance from centralized resources for their code review is able to do so. It is not a requirement, uh, unlike some organizations we know of. Uh, we have it's voluntary, but we do have a system, a uh, set of guidelines and practices, a team that can do code reviews, um, uh, and as I'll talk about later, uh, reproducibility uh, checks um, modeled after. Uh, Folks here, like Lars, have put that together, which is a, a great help for us in the field. Um, the process automation support for publishing. So we have a number of R and Python and Stata and other packages that um, produce graphs and charts and um, fact sheets and other things automatically from code and put them in our urban style. And so that means that people can automatically produce publications, can automatically produce and reproduce and fix and easily regenerate uh, graphs and charts, uh, which we think really helps with um, quality control, but also uh, enabling in the future a pipeline where you could imagine people writing uh, and editing entire papers in these statistical programs back and forth with editing software to produce uh, something that would go directly on our website in HTML fashion so that we could produce uh, some sort of transparent pipeline from writing the code and drawing down the code into putting it on our website, which is a long term goal. Um, obviously, we have some funder and journals that uh, our researchers submit to or are funded by that do require um, transparency in their work. And so some of that is um, you know, driven by you have to put your code up or you, your data has to be up in a certain place. Um, and they all, many of them have different requirements, but there are requirements nonetheless that require you know, either data uh, sometimes open source code, though that's limited to a few funders like the Sloan Foundation uh, or others um, that we are required to, to comply for uh, with uh, per our contracts or per the journal. And then um, we do have an internal code library that we've been building over the past, uh, more recent over the past year, where researchers um, who have particularly useful or reused code have been submitting and are easily able to find across uh, a number of different uh, areas code that would be useful to reuse and regenerate and for different projects. And so this helps immensely with reducing the burden on uh, researchers who are reinventing the wheel or or have documentation requirements that uh, for specific projects and making it easier to find that code and to execute it and to make their lives a lot easier. Um, and so these are sort of the, as I said, many um, initiatives that we have across urban. Most of these are voluntary, with the exception of the data catalog. If you'd like to post anything publicly that, that that's data or in, uh, on our website, we, we do require it be posted to the data catalog. Um, so to, to Alex's second part of the question, in terms of successes, uh, as I mentioned, um, 
I think as a result, all of our data we publish is in great shape. We have a clear license. People know how to use it. They know how to cite it. Uh, as a result, we can really clearly demonstrate impact. People, we can see people using it. We can see, we hear about stories and people ask us questions, especially about how they're using our data. We can see how many people are downloading it. We can see you know, where they're linking back to us. We can see high profile use cases of that data. So that's really valuable in terms of like the data we put out there. And we found that to be um, pretty motivating for the people who do put up the data to get them to you know, continue to see the data catalog in a good light. Um, code review and reproducibility checks when they go through uh, our process voluntarily, often catch and fix issues. Uh, there are very few of them that, don't, that find nothing as I'm sure others here and uh, Lars can attest to. Um, uh, is a similar, I'm guessing it's a similar case across institutions, but that's certainly our, um, uh, our experience. Uh, Process automation just allows for quick error fixing, right? When you're generating 50 state fact sheets and you really made a small error on uh, in, in the way you program that affects, you know, a join with three rows, just fixing that and rerunning and, and republishing the reports is much easier uh, and reduces friction and makes people look good. And it's just a great way of thinking about uh, how do we become both more transparent, but also work better. Um, we have a number of projects, especially our uh, data features and data tools that are focused that are posted on GitHub. Then many fewer of our research studies, probably only a handful, are actually um, on there in public. Uh, as I said, I don't think we're that far along in that um, medium. Uh, obviously, we have packages submitted to ICPSR to some journals where we it's required we have um, uh, posted uh, the, the code and the data but it's very few funders and um, uh, journals that we have submitted to in my experience that have required that uh, so far. So we haven't done it much uh, outside of those voluntary cases. Um, and where there is a requirement, we have a process in place, as I said, if, if you want to do a reproducibility check here at Urban, it's probably not as robust as uh, some of the other folks that will speak here uh, or across the um, our, our peer institutions, but where there's a requirement, we do have processing in place. So we do have a process in place for doing code review for um, reproducibility checks and other. And so we're ready to, to ramp that up if people did desire it. I'd say the, the challenges, which is maybe the more interesting part for some, um, as I said, a lot of voluntary adoption, which is limited to a few cases of self-motivated folks here at Urban. Uh, because people are fi primarily focused here on impact and fundraising, we don't always get that massive interest in uh, something that seems unrelated to many researchers, I'll be honest. Um, quality control is outside of impact and fundraising is obviously very important to researchers, but they'll all say, I know how to do that right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to read your resources, but I define quality control in this way, which is slightly different than the way some other researcher defines how they would think of top quality control. And they're not uh, always open to that change. And I think part of that reason, and having been a researcher myself, um, at Urban in the past is that, you know, there's always a lot of bureaucracy to deal with um, when you're talking about funders and grants and contracts and private data sets and a lot of uh, negotiations and legal folks and things you can do and things you can't do. Uh, and researchers generally, at least at Urban, really enjoy independence and, um, and control over their work. And so sometimes uh, these types of transparency efforts can be seen as um, reducing that independence and control, which is a really important factor to consider. Um, that's been hampering our ability to expand this work. Uh, funders in general in our space have been moving more toward direct impact work and how we can advise and, and provide technical assistance and other things. And, and honestly, we've seen funder, the big funders in this space are shifting more toward impact and shifting less toward core research and more toward policy change. And sometimes as a result, that's meant that funders have had less of a focus on the on the transparency of the work and more of the focus on the impact. Um, but to the extent we can tie the two together, I think we'll have success. Uh, we have a decentralized organization, which means that if from the top someone says you have to do something, but a funder says differently, ultimately the funder is likely to win uh, if there is a conflict. Um, and it's, lastly, I'll say it's hard as a result of all these things, it's hard for me and my team to make this a priority, even if we wanted to, given we work on all these cross-functional teams. We don't live in a silo. We control everything. We often work uh, with as data scientists and research programmers and data tool creators across teams who have different goals and different um, capacities. Uh, I'll finish on this one, which is to say, or uh, one more actually, but I'll finish on this one for the benefits, which is to say we can significantly avoid 
major snafus and trust issues. If we if we catch major errors, of course, we have indirect impact through our data and code. And we have many examples to prove this, and I can't go over it now. But I also say automation saves time, allows for really cool new tools that are available. I'm really excited for some of the work we're doing there uh, to enable the whole pipeline from drawing down the data to publishing on our website, um, all in code. Uh, I think saving a lot of time, obviously, is a huge advantage for anyone, and that's been a much bigger, I think, draw for voluntary uptake. And then lastly, um, uh, a big unseen benefit often is that for long running projects, especially documentation, having new RAs or other researchers come on enables better collaboration, better sharing, better learning across the organization, which is ultimately just better for us. So I'll close by saying I'm a uh, and this is probably not the topic that you that you asked about, Alex, but these are my personal opinions, not Urban's. I'm a big proponent of funders and journals requiring reproducibility checks at a minimum. I really think they would have a number of benefits, as I just talked about. Uh, we would have the, the infrastructure in place to comply if necessary. And um, yeah, I, I generally just am a big fan of making sure that we continue in that vein of uh, being able to make that happen. So um, with that, I'll say, you folks can contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, and thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Graham. That was a great presentation. Um, I mean, a lot of, you know, you uh, touched on a lot of topics that I think have always been, you know, to, to us sort of reproducibility uh, pushers onto the, to the science, right? That there's, you know, it's, it's very easy to see the cost, right? Like, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, why is there another person in my project telling me what to do versus all of these benefits that it seems like it's been more, it seems exponentially more difficult to sort of uh, be able to get across uh, to researchers, right? Or uh, researchers only really realize later that like, oh, okay, it would have been great if like two years ago, uh, I had, you know, commented my code and created an actual pipeline for uh, reproducibility. Do you, do you get a sense of, you know, within urban, how um, there, you know, are there ways in which you might be able to emphasize the benefits more to, to get more buy-in from people there? Yeah, I certainly think, as I said, aligning with impact and aligning with fundraising capability are the two keys for us. So if you can do that, as I said, you know, making things easier for people is always a good sell. So automation of the whole pipeline, making things simpler and fit into their workflow, making it seem like that's something that, um, you know, that would directly benefit one of those two at end states is super valuable. And so to the extent, you know, there are funders that are more interested in this sort of thing, or, you know, I, I love that. And I love to be able to say, oh, hey, we actually have this written up and they see it as a huge help to their fundraising, which is why I'm advocating for that sort of thing. Um, but at, on the other hand, if we keep it uh, to the voluntary segment, which is, you know, I'm very interested in this work. I want to make it happen. It's something that's, you know, that I think is particularly important. I think there are benefits to the automation and the and the improvements that we've made, but I don't know that that will mean a fast uptake over time. I think it will be more of a generational change. So I do right. worry about our ability to be effective without those. Makes sense. Uh, well, thank you, Graham. Uh, now we're going to move on to Lee Moore Pierre. Uh, Limor, you've been a key part of the transparency and reproducibility discussion, and not just at Yale. Uh, can you describe how you solicit and maintain engagement at your institution for these efforts? And what are the drivers of those efforts? Sure. Thanks, Alex. And, uh, and thanks to you and Lars for uh, inviting me to uh, join you for this, um, for this seminar. Uh, it's been really great so far, and I've learned a lot. And I can really relate to some of the comments that Graham made at the end there about um, volunteering and seeing the the you know seeing the value and getting researchers on board to do things that that they might not always want to uh, to do on their own, um, at least initially. So I'll talk today a little bit about um, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies just to give you a sense of what we do and how we do it, and then I'll talk about. Um, try to answer the question about uh, for this uh, session, which is why can or should research institutions publish replication packages with a little twist on the question, um, which is um, that I'm going to answer the question, why should they verify the reproducibility of replication packages? 
Um, so first, a little bit about um, Institution for Social and Policy Studies, ISPS. Uh, it's been around since 1969, uh, 68 at Yale, uh, coming up on 50 years now, uh, 55 years. Um, it's an interdisciplinary center at Yale. Uh, we have affiliated faculty from various social sciences, as well as some of our professional schools who are um, concerned with social and economic uh, policies questions. Um, our faculty live in their departments, but they come to us to uh, collaborate, work on different projects, and we also have various programs around particular uh, questions, uh, big questions that, that we think are important to, um, to collaborate on. Um, and it'll become important the, to make the point that we have affiliates, we don't have our own faculty, um, and so the, the point about um, sort of making any requirements uh, will be uh, uh, will be pertinent. So the kinds of research that we do, especially since 2000, a lot of it is experimental. Um, Alan Gerber is our director currently. Gerber and Green published a, a landmark um, uh, study in political science about uh, uh, getting out the vote uh, using uh, the method of a field experiments. We have a lot of experiment studies. Um, but not only, um, various uh, sort of things um, that, that we do. Um, back in 2010, um, as an institution uh, under Don Green at the time, um, we uh, sort of stated our mission, had this realization that um, we would like to share the data and, uh, and the code and all of the materials that are underlying this body of research. Um, and make it available to everyone, share it publicly. Um, hand in hand with that, we also um, established very early on, and again, this is back in around 2010, that we have a responsibility and also uh, are developing expertise to help our researchers do this in the best way possible. In other words, uh, do the kind of QA uh, that we have been talking about here um, and make sure that the materials that they are making available are indeed reproducing the results that they claim that they have. Um, and so we thought that it, as an institution, it's our responsibility. Um, and also we're offering an opportunity for our researchers to, to have uh, a second uh, look at their materials and review them before uh, they share them with the um, institutional, with the uh, scientific community. So these, uh, just as an example, uh, study, this is in this case, it's a list experiment. These are the kinds of materials that we get from a researcher. Um, this, in this case, it's a very uh, uh, small compendium. Um, oftentimes, uh, especially lately, um, they're a lot larger. Um, but uh, we want to connect the data, the, uh, the articles, um, and, um, and uh, make that all available. So our um, archive uh, was launched. We're calling it an archive. It's really more of a dissemination platform at the moment. Um, where we make all this available. We launched it around 2011. Uh, it was a pilot for an organization within Yale called ODAI, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's the Office of Data Assets, in, Data Assets and Infrastructure. Um, again, this is a specialized community. It's meant to serve a specific community. Um, it's meant to focus primarily on experimental design, quantitative data. We had some uh, parameters in place um, right from the get-go. Uh, that will have uh, open access, that it'll be a, a, a CC license, that uh, everything will be shown through our website and that we'll be using Yale infrastructure. So those are were kind of like some of our, our limitations. Um, this is basically where we are uh, right now uh, to give you a sense of scale. Uh, it's a fairly small scale operation. Um, I like to think of it as a well-tended garden, um, which I think is, um, good in itself. So we can talk maybe a little bit later about scaling up. Um, it's a question that I always get, and I just feel that sometimes that, that scale is uh, is good um, in many cases, but sometimes um, staying small and, um, and really high quality is okay too. Um, so you could see that we have somewhere around 120, 125 published studies or, or compendia um, so that encompasses, you know, about 2,500 files um, or so that are associated with these studies. We get these submissions at various points in the workflow. 
Um, sometimes we get them voluntarily from researchers, and sometimes, um, in some cases, we grab copies of things that they've already published. So more along the lines of the data catalog that Graham mentioned, um, but we do more than just catalog the existence of it. We will also do the full review on a copy of something that was potentially published somewhere else. Um, like was already mentioned, a lot of times we find some problems. And so we will work with the researchers um, to um, uh, remedy those problems. Um, to get to the question about sort of um, who's involved, who we have relied on, what are their drivers, why would they want to do this at an institution like Yale? Uh, this is a very rough timeline and I listed some of the main partners that we have here. Um, Again, this has been kind of on a small scale and it's been personality based in a sense, people who are highly motivated to see this through and follow through, who've partnered with, with us um, and helped us. Um, so it's based again in the mission, kind of a stated mission that we have at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies. But I think that our partners bring some of their own motivations and drivers um, to to the table when they when they partner with us. Um, so uh, uh, the Office of Digital Assets and Infrastructure (ODAI) that I mentioned, it was a it, it didn't live uh, very long at Yale, um, and our our uh, overlap with them was not very long. Um, but they were charged with um, sort of uh, dealing, handling, managing, and coming up with solutions for all digital assets across the university. Um, and we were a pilot, an early pilot for research data. Uh, data, if we consider it as, a, as, a, as an asset at the university, then then how do we how we do we deal with it? And so where to put it? How to how to share it? Those were the kind of questions that we worked in. Um, the library was involved with us from the beginning. We had some connections with library IT. They had their own interest in this. Um, they wanted to look at uh, research data preservation. That's uh, tricky. Yale didn't have and still doesn't really have an institutional repository. Um, so there's a question of how, where do we put this? How do we do it? Uh, how do we link it to the catalog? So we had some interest in the library on uh, exposing uh, through the uh, library catalog and then questions of metadata, how to describe and what is the minimum required metadata. Um, another important partner that was uh, based in our library is our stat lab. And they partnered with us because they were looking for solutions for data sharing. So this was starting to be um, more of an issue in the early uh, 2010s. Um, and, um, and, and it was coming up, bubbling up from researchers. They wanted to uh, provide some solution. Um, we've since transitioned to more support um, by ITS, um, for primarily on the infrastructure. Um, so there's a group faculty and staff support that's helping us. There's a group um, that's uh, helping us with um, installation of some of our software in the cloud. Um, and um, I put in at last here, the Data Intensive Social Science at Center, DISC, um, love our acronyms, um, but this is a new initiative at Yale and um, is very concerned and um, focused on research support services. And we think that this could be um, one of one of these uh, services um, that, that would come under the umbrella of an organization like DISC. So we can partner with them on both uh, the service side, the infrastructure side, um, and some of the uh, uh, other support. So um, just a quick word about our, our approach. We think that if we're very, our quality control is to verify reproducibility, right? So People can put stuff in a lot of places. This has increased since the since around 2010 when we first started this. Um, uh, it's become easy and um, more acceptable um, for for researchers to post all their materials. We just think that there isn't um, always that um, quality control that that uh, should be put in place. So we came up with a um, framework for thinking about it. I won't go into it very much, but I'll just mention that what we're doing is basically data curation kind of in the mold of um, careful um, uh, uh, careful attention to the digital objects to make them reusable and um, to be able to preserve them in the long term, as well as the code review or verification um, and reproduction. Um, so that looks like um, something like that. I have a, a small staff um, that is made of of graduate students who are basically RAs 
and we look at various uh, aspects of the of the research compendium. The DQR, the Data Quality Review Framework, both guides our workflow um, and also the feedback that we give um, our, our authors. So uh, to help us with our workflow, we also developed a tool we're calling YARD, the Yale Application for Research Data. Um, and if you could imagine in this in this um, slide, if there was some kind of like line that goes right through the middle where it says YARD, um, I like to think of, of it as being kind of like a filter. So we have all of this material coming in, different people with different um, roles, um, maybe touching the materials, the data, the code. Um, but we have this sort of like filter where what comes out on the other side has been um, tended to. Um, and uh, and uh, and quality assurance was was uh, performed. Um, so that's generally about um, ISPS and and what we do and how we do it and and why. And I wanted to uh, try to give a couple of answers, actually three answers, to this question: Why can or should research institutions verify the reproducibility of of replication packages? So this is my my attempt at that. So I guess uh, the first answer I would say is um, that if um, I love this quote here from this uh, from this paper called Error Tight, uh, in industry industries that rely heavily on coding, it would be considered poor practice to publish code that a single person had written and no one had verified in house. So I mean I think that there's some practices that we can learn from other. Um, sectors, maybe the, the industry, for example, and, and the software uh, sector, um, but uh, we don't really do that. And so it seems uh, that common sense that uh, in our case, if we think about ISPS as a research center or, or a lab, that there would be some um, effort around uh, quality review um, just to make sure that um, things work the way they intend to work. I will make the point that that maybe wasn't clear, but when we say code review and, and quality, you know, we're, we're talking about making sure that things work the way they uh, are reported to work. We are not making judgment about the research itself or any of the procedures that the uh, authors uh, uh, chose. Um, but I think that, you know, if we think of science as a self-correcting system, um, no one is immune to making mistakes. Um, and so this is an opportunity to um, kind of correct at least these sort of technical um, uh, issues. Um, another uh, reason that I think institutions should be involved in this sort of work um, is to build institutional competencies around open science. So if open science, if we agree for coming to a point where there's a consensus that open science is something we care about and want to do, um, we, building institutional competencies is important. Um, and I think that uh, verifying reproducibility is one of them. And I'll just mention here um, efforts like uh, data stewardship that is um, especially going on in Europe, um, which are institutional based, I think are, are a great example. And this is uh, the last thing I wanna say um, here, which is again around open science, um, uh, advocating for culture change. And so uh, this, this is a great uh, figure that I, I took from Etienne Roche, um, uh, just presented this in, uh, in RDA, um, but he makes the point that, um, you know, so this is the famous uh, change uh, pyramid. Uh, it, it, you know, you need to make it possible, make it easy, normative, rewarding, uh, rewarded and, and, and required. And his point is that institutions kind of like touch on all of those things or have a hand in all of those things or can promote all of these things. Um, they have that uh, capacity. And so um, I think the idea of that, that, that capacity, um, they also have that responsibility. Um, so I will end with that and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Peer. Yeah, that uh, that quote from uh, the air, was it air tight that, that really hits close to home, especially for economics. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I have questions, but I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask them to you during the question period. Um, so thank you. Uh, now on to Courtney Butler. Uh, you initiated an effort uh, which was CrossFed, I believe, to make more of the uh, underlying code and research papers available, even before Fed researchers uh, submit to journals, including posting some of them on uh, the Kansas Fed web pages, 
uh, and other and other outlets. Can you describe the origin of such efforts uh, and any challenges you encountered, uh, both from the policy and technological uh, sides, and where you see the sort of initiative heading? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk through that, and I'll just pull up my slides real quick. I'll assume someone will stop me if, if not, that's not the case. So um, I'll start by just making a quick disclaimer that I'm no longer over this process. My colleague, Kira Lillard, who is here on the call today, also took over about a year and a half ago when I moved into my current role. Um, but I was involved with standing it up initially and can speak to that thought process that led us to where we are today, um, specifically for the Kansas City Fed. So we have definitely done some information and practice sharing with other feds. And of course, there are times when there are co-authors from multiple feds, but the effort I'm talking about today is really scoped to Kansas City. And around six or seven years ago, our researchers were sharing data, but it was done on a pretty infrequent ad hoc basis where the researchers would be contacted directly and then be responsible themselves for fulfilling requests that they saw fit. And then during the same time, the re research library was also working on standing up more data preservation services for archival purposes. And as we asked questions like, what should we preserve and why? We ended up diving a little deeper into this world of reproducibility and the idea of long-term availability of data files. Um, so Kira, who I mentioned before, the library manager, Brett Courier, and I ultimately ended up publishing a working paper about a year ago about how data preservation fits into journal data policies. And what we found in our digging in our, and in our research really resonated with how we think about approaching our work in general in the Federal Reserve. And so I just want to start by highlighting a couple of about us items from the Kansas City Fed in particular. Um, so first, our mission is to work in the public's interest by supporting economic and financial stability. And one of the things we do in service of that mission is to work on public and community engagement with a focus on public understanding, um, with the key word in all of that being public. So having an outward facing focus is an essential part of our identity. And then to build on that, two of our values are integrity and service. So once again, we exist to serve the public. Um, but we also do so with those high ethical standards. So for us, when we're trying to think about what the right degree of transparency should be, uh, we ultimately decided that we wanted to prioritize high transparency. Um, so this time period also happened to coincide with the time of increasing journal expectations around sharing data, um, which also contributed to this decision and the evolution of this process. Uh, but a lot of journal policies, especially at that time, allowed for exceptions for things like proprietary data. But rather than leaning on that option, we felt like it was important to instead open up the door even more intentionally for researchers to share their code and data because their research informs important economic policies and decision-making and transparency around that was one way that the bank could tangibly demonstrate its commitment to integrity and public trust. So over the last several years, that's meant going from that more informal approach to a more structured one that enables secure, ethical, and effective data sharing. And there are definitely lots of hurdles and difficulties to sharing the data we work with, like the fact that so much of it is proprietary from data vendors um, or sensitive with things like PII. Um, so we recognize that's a challenge, uh, but it's one we try to face head on. So we don't assume that just because something is sensitive or proprietary, that there's no way to share it. Um, we've actually had a lot of success with just asking vendors for permission on an as-needed basis and working to incorporate explicit language that allows sharing into our contracts uh, when we negotiate them. And then we can also use methods like aggregation or synthetic data to help facilitate things where, ne where needed. Um, but in other words, because our goal is to enable that high level of transparency, um, if our researchers choose to share their data or are required to by something like a journal, then we can do, then we do what we can to make that happen um, within reason. And so uh, just a little bit on what this process looks like from a very high level. Um, the process is ultimately initiated by our researchers. Uh, as I said before, the research library creates the opportunity to share, <clears throat> but it's ultimately up to the discretion of the researchers themselves as to when data sharing makes sense. Um, you know, for example, sometimes the underlying materials involve all kinds of moving parts and there are open questions about what and how to share, um, especially when that replication package is particularly complex. 
Or sometimes the data is so sensitive that even our best efforts to safely share that information might not feel sufficient and uh, protecting sensitive data is the higher priority. So there have been ongoing efforts to continue building a culture and to foster a climate of sharing within the organization. Um, and there was of course some resistance early on, but we've definitely seen steadily increasing uptake over the years. Um, and we still don't have any mandates or requirements instituted at this time because um, we do feel that decision is ultimately best left with the researchers themselves. So once the request is initiated, the library reviews the files and coordinates the rest of the process on behalf of the researcher. Um, there are typically three prongs involved in the package preparation phase. Uh, first is a legal review of things like contracts and terms of use. Um, the second prong is information security, where we review the files to ensure that our systems and confidential information remain secure. Because um, obviously risk management is a critical piece in all of this. And so establishing those uh, legal and information security processes did require a bit of negotiation um, and ongoing conversation to set up and then continue to evolve and refine. Um, but I think it's also ended up being a good relationship building opportunity with these two functions. Um, and then finally, the third prong is a readme document that includes information like a license, a list and description of the files and instructions for using them, uh, the packages fixity and reference entries for the data sources, all things that we see as important for long term usability of the file both today and 10 or more years from now. Um, because the Fed is a long lived institution. We've been here for over 100 years and we expect to be here for many more. And uh, we want that trust we're trying to build to extend into the future as well as informing the audiences of today. So we strive to complete that process within about two weeks. Um, sometimes we can turn it around much faster for something like a media request. And sometimes it takes longer if there are any issues that come up that we need to work through. Um, but once all those steps are completed, the package is ready for publication and there are a wide variety of possible outlets for that. Um, we can post the file on our website or upload it to an external repository. Um, the researcher can send it to a requester via email or submit it to a journal or wherever else the file needs to go. Um, and I have just a couple of examples here where you can see them posted on our website uh, and in a couple of different ways and then in open ICPSR. And so the last thing I'll touch on is just how we think about resourcing internally versus outsourcing externally. And what drives our decision making here more than anything is the philosophy that once the package leaves our internal systems, we consider it public. Um, it doesn't really matter if the package has been emailed to a single well-known colleague at another university. We no longer have control over that file. Um, so we need to feel comfortable that it could be viewed by any external audience. So the curation process is completed entirely by internal staff to help ensure that high confidence that we're releasing something we feel ready to share. And then as I showed before, once the file is curated and ready to publish, there are many avenues both internally and externally available to go about actually distributing those packages. Um, we've put less structure around the actual publication of the package at this time because it's that preparation aspect that feels like the higher priority. Um, and we feel like that part can only be accomplished internally. Now that said, uh, a zip file on a website is obviously not optimal for preservation or discovery. Uh, we've been investigating other options like partnering with an external repository for distribution. And that's probably the biggest next step on the horizon, but it just hasn't made sense for us up to this point to invest in a homegrown tool for that purpose. Um, but that also requires maintaining an eye towards scalability because as our researchers share more and more of their code and data, um, we obviously see that as a good thing, but it also requires more capacity from our library staff uh, and others involved in the curation process. Um, because that curation piece does require a decent amount of capacity to accomplish. Uh, moving data files through the process is not a rubber stamp situation. Not only does it involve several different stakeholders once you bring in groups like legal and information security, um, there are also decisions and judgment calls that have to be made on every single release. Um, no two packages release the same data, so no two releases are the same. And we run into a lot of the same challenges that Graham and Lamore have discussed. So it's a team effort and it can be time consuming and requires an understanding of the data we use and the context of the organization that it's created in. But again, it's also a process that allows us to put 
a lot of intention around our data sharing, and most importantly, to confidently and securely publish replication packages in that spirit of contributing to the mission and values of our organization. So I appreciate you letting me share this with you today, and I have both mine and Kira's information on here. Um, and yeah, I look forward to those questions. Thank you, Courtney. I also hope that the Fed exists for a long time. Uh, uh, so I'd like to thank all the panelists for the thought-provoking and interesting material. I'm going to now open up the webinar to questions again. Uh, please enter any further questions you have in the chat. We welcome further, in, uh, further queries to a particular panelist or broader questions directed to you know, a group. As of before, I will be monitoring the Zoom chat for questions as well. So we actually have a really interesting question from Talia Cooper. Um, this, uh, the question reads, question from the perspective of a curator, especially for Dr. Peer, in an institutional repository context where a lot of researchers are primarily motivated to submit data or code because of a funder requirement, how do you think we can incentivize higher quality and more reproducible submissions uh, from researchers? So I think this is a question for everybody, but I'll let Dr. Peer sort of start us off. Thank you. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. I mean, I think that one, um, using the service is, a, is an incentive in itself because I think that they see uh, the benefits and then are more likely to come back. And so we see that that does happen um, often. Um, and then also word kind of gets around. I think that that's one, um, you know, you have to start somewhere, but that that does seem to help. I think uh, seeing a good example is another one uh, that could incentivize uh, just seeing a really well done replication package. Sometimes people just need to see it to understand what, what it is they need to do. And the last thing I'll say is some training. Um, I mean, just to help push a little bit um, to get people to start thinking about this earlier um, can also get them in the right place. Graham, Courtney, anybody want to chime in? Um, sometimes we use use cases back at the researchers themselves. We'll point to really influential research and say, you've cited this in your paper recently, or you use this data. Isn't it nice that it was accessible and that you were able to uh, uh, build on that? And so, you know, kind of looking at carrying that forward, um, passing that along and trying to um, create a shared practice, helping them understand those times when they've benefited from the process um, so that they can then contribute to the process and let others benefit from it as well. So sort of behavioral nudges. Uh... <laughs> this reminds me of a similar topic I was having with one of my collaborators, um, Claire Bowen, who's an expert in data privacy. And um, we were talking about we recently done a survey of economists asking um, how many people have heard of the term differential privacy? Like I'd even heard of it and more than half of them hadn't, <laughs> right? And I, I think this is a similar topic in some ways. Uh, if I ask people, you know, how many people have heard of, you know, how we do these reproducibility checks or I, I would bet the even few, I don't know, maybe it'd be the same if even fewer, but I would bet even fewer at my institution at least would know what that meant or what that entailed. So I, I identify with the idea of training a lot. And I feel like we're uh, in your, in uh, Limor, in your, in your sort of like uh, institutional diagram, <laughs> the like, it's not it's definitely not a norm because I don't feel like we, a lot of people even know about it yet. Uh, so that's an important step. Uh, we have another question from Maria Jones. Uh, asking, could any of the panelists speak more about the metadata used for code publication? So um, at the World Bank, uh, we're working on more systematic core publication, but are not aware of existing metadata standards for code. Uh, so she suggests it would be keen to know how others have handled this and if there are any models uh, that they can look at uh, to develop their sort of metadata schema. I know that there are some efforts around that, and I could try to find that, that they've been mentioned in forums such as um, the RDA, the Research Data Alliance group working on uh, making software a first class research object. And so metadata has been one of their concerns. Um, I'll try to get 
the the right link um, to share. But I think it's a really important question. Absolutely. Agreed. It's an important question. I we haven't thought about it. I would I would I would have a similar one if we were to go more down this road. You know, I think um, always using the existing standards that are out there would be amazing. Uh, but I am not aware of them. Yeah, we obviously have a lot of opportunity to grow, I think, from a public facing descriptive perspective. Um, we have developed a like a preservation standard internally based off some of those things like Dublin Core premise mods um, that we, we might be able to share. Um, but it, it's definitely a room for there's space to grow both uh, for us and in the industry in that vein. Great. Um, there's a question to Courtney. Uh, so given legal and other, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, legal and other departments can be slow. How does the Fed reduce the time it takes uh, down to just two weeks? Um, yeah, that's what I referenced, that there was a lot of conversation to make that happen. Um, it probably took us uh, months, if not years, to get to a place where um, we had kind of those agreements in place with those stakeholders. But um, what we focused on in those conversations was really communicating what we needed and why. Um, so we see a lot of these turnaround times with our economists being because of media inquiries or because of publication deadlines. You know, those R&Rs are not uh, extended processes sometimes. Um, so as, able, we, as we were able to talk through um, sort of what they had to offer and why we were asking for what we needed, we could kind of land on that compromise of about um, two weeks as a standard turnaround time. But um, we do also kind of continuously reevaluate that because two weeks feels like an eternity to some of our, our economists, even if it seems fast to us. Um, so that it's kind of keeps being an ongoing conversation of what makes sense from an expectation. Um, and a lot of it just goes back to relationship building um, and, and communication around the purpose of the process. Yeah, two weeks sounds like actually like a snap of the fingers for me too. That seems like very fast. Uh, um, so this, uh, th there's an- Can I add, do you mind if I add to that though really program, quickly, which is uh, one of, on, our, on our data catalog, we saw something really interesting around our review, which is like some of that, I saw you had multiple strata, Courtney, if I can use those words, of, of the review. And I feel like we do too. And some of it's like, absolutely has to happen before anything can come out, right? And then there's others, which is, which, we learned didn't need to do happen until after it came out and like like editorial for example like you know you just making grammatical errors in what in the way you wrote the entry and we have reputation to uphold <laughs> and researchers want to be perfect and so does the institution and right and so but then we realized one of the benefits of of having the the snapshots or of having the revision history of our data catalog right everything's out there you can see all 100 revisions of the data set and see exactly what was changed and go back. We use DCAN as our, when we an adopted version of DCAN that we've modified. Um, and we were just like, if there are errors, we'll change them, right? That doesn't need to hold up. That can save us a couple of days. That saves us a couple of days or that saves us a few, a week. Like, let's just put it out there. And you have, you just have to, you researcher, like we're on you, we're gonna, you're gonna have to change that in a few days <laughs> and you'll make that change. And I know you'll wanna make that change because you wanna make it perfect, but at least your thing will be out and you'll be able to do what you wanna do. And, you know, I feel like that flexibility, like the openness was an advantage there, which was kind of nice. <laughs> uh, so this is a question to everybody. Uh, what do you do when you conduct a reproducibility check after the original publication has already happened? So do you update the replication package do you issue a core agendum, which is a word I had to Google right now, uh, or something else? <laughs> yeah, that happened to us. So, I mean, first of all, so we might, we go into it knowing that we might, that we have a copy of something that was published maybe on Dataverse or something like that, and that the copies might not be identical. Um, and so you have to be like, okay with that. Um, our researchers will often, um, if there needs to be any update to the code because there's just like some minor problem, um, we will um, note that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll add a, a curator README to our package that explains the differences. Um, and in some cases, we've had a couple of cases where there was a, and I don't know how to pronounce that word, is it corrigendum or cor corrigendum? But, but you know, when when something was already published, and um, in this case, a scale was reversed, and 
you know, there was a problem like that. And, um, and the journal did publish that. Um, and uh, I think, I believe that after that, the replicate, the official DOI for the package that was deposited with the journal, um, that, you know, that package was updated. It's better to catch these things earlier, <laughs> let's just say. Yeah, Earlier again, in that's... the process is better, and we try to emphasize that all the time. Like, why not take advantage of this and and get it uh, before it goes out there? Yeah, I mean, in a computer science context, right? Like, uh, coders would are always looking for reviews, right? They want people to look at their code to to check for quality. Um, so I think uh, we have two minutes left. I, I'll 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 take the risk and I'll ask the question. So if you're not making a full replication package public due to confidential data, is there like a public catalog of the existence uh, of that package, or if you know if it's not if it's not public access, do you do you have anything maybe to say to that? We will publish the code and um, and we'll explain how to get uh, access to the data if possible or why it's uh, it's restricted. But yeah, we will we will have we are our unit is the study. So yeah. Okay. That's um, we have something similar. We can publish uh, partial packages uh, with some explanation. Um, but we don't have a, um, and sometimes we'll include like an available upon request type note in a publication, um, but we don't have kind of a thorough accounting of all of the replication packages that might be available or preserved internally. Cool. And we've done, we haven't done that internally. We haven't tackled that internally at all. <laughs> we mostly do uh, rely on external parties that we're required to submit those to for our requests, like, you know, ICPSR or others. So. That was perfect. Okay. Uh, so thank you uh, all for attending this CRUST webinar. Uh, how do journal, uh, whether and why should uh, institutions uh, value replicability? I want to thank our speakers, Graham McDonald, Lamore Peer, and Courtney Butler uh, for presenting and our audience members for attending and asking questions. Our next session will be on April 25th at our usual time at 4.15. Eastern, when we discuss should funders require reproducible archives, which I think you'll all find uh, interesting. Uh, please register as always on our website, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you.